Welcome everybody to UFO Man Live. My name is Tim or UFO Man. My co-host is Tom Reed from UFO Expo TV and we want to welcome everybody watching on UFO Expo TV as well. And my secondary co-host is Rhiannon Alley. Please welcome her to the panel as well. Hey guys. I can't hear you Rhiannon. Welcome. Glad to be here. <laughs> okay, we have a special guest tonight. His name is John Burroughs. He is famous uh, for being one of the participants <clears throat> at the uh, RAF Woodbridge Bentwaters uh, Rendlesham Forest UFO incident. Um, he joined the Air Force in 1979 and was stationed at RAF Bentwaters. So please welcome John Burroughs. Thanks welcome, for John. having me on. Thanks for having me on, guys. Absolutely. Hey, I got a question before we get started. Okay. I love your intro. That's one of the best ones I've ever seen. So whoever did that, awesome. But I did. Was that that um, picture of the aircraft carrier, was that the Enterprise incident that you were trying to recreate? Yes. Okay. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's nice to know it's – it's, uh, Approved by John. Yeah. <laughs> Approved by John Burroughs. Cool. Well, yeah. I've done I've done radio. I've had my own shows. I've seen a lot. I've yeah. done a lot of shows. That is by far the best intro I've ever seen. I was including, on your show. Yeah, oh, including cool. the ones that we did. That is a really good intro. Yeah, <laughs> Thank like you. It. Yeah. Um, okay, John. I'm gonna ask you to uh share with our viewers and our people in the chat a little bit about yourself and how you got involved into joining the Air Force and how this all came about and what happened to you? It was, uh, it was during the, it was the, during the Cold War. I don't know most people, I don't know how old your audience is, but if you go back into that time frame in the seventies and eighties, the economy was bad. There wasn't a lot of jobs. Uh, inflation was high like it is now, but it was something that I decided to do after high school. I actually played basketball and I had some offers to maybe go to college, but I wasn't a big uh, school guy. I love sports, but I wasn't a big school guy. So I just decided to join the Air Force, uh, get out of my town, small town in Illinois and go out and see the world. But I didn't really expect to see the world world right away. I was hoping to see some more of the United States, <laughs> then maybe move on overseas. But my first assignment, I joined in March of 79. I got assigned to the 81st TAC fighter wing at Aria Betwaters Woodbridge in the United Kingdom. And so there it went. I went through uh, basic training, the law enforcement academy. I was a law enforcement specialist. And I... Uh, Got shipped out to England in uh, July of 79 and spent my first two years of my Air Force career, which I ended up making a career out of it. Spent 27 years in, but spent my first two years over in the uh, United Kingdom. Sounds very interesting to me um, being stationed first in the UK. Very awesome. Uh, Tom? Yeah, as far as what questions or just uh, yeah questions. I'm just happy that he's here. I've known John for a long time, and uh, it's nice to finally uh, you know be able to spend an, un an uninterrupted hour uh, talking with him because uh, you know I've got a lot of questions and and things that uh, have always been unclear to me too. You know, but I don't really yeah. like to overly pry sometimes. But you know, uh, tonight I've got a lot, a lot of questions. Like uh, for instance, um, you know, if something were uh, if you were to uh, not talk about this anymore. Who do you think would be the most uh, viable or honest um, person to have to speak to on behalf of what happened there? Who do you feel is on the up and up and honest and and who, you know, that uh, could also uh, shed some light as to what really happened? Well, that's one of the hardest questions I've ever been asked to answer. And honestly, <laughs> Colonel Hall has been misleading from the beginning with the memo. And I, a lot of people, I'm not 100% sure why, other than he must have been involved with inside the government, how they decided to cover it up. So it's not that he's ever really lied about his part of the event. He's just been wrong or misleading or lie by omission about the rest of the stuff to including attacking all the witnesses at some time or another, right. trying to right. hurt their credibility. But 
he would probably be the one that I would say if you had to listen to somebody else, he's been pretty honest about, as far as I know, about his involvement on when he went out there, the tape and everything else. But then he went down the slippery slope of, like he started out by saying Adrian Bastins and I weren't even involved, but comes to be proof after the tape came out, he had to admit we were. Then he right. said we didn't get out in front of him, and finally that was proven that we did. So, But he's probably the one other go-to person. Other than there's a one person that won't talk very, <laughs> talk very little, that would be Adrian Bastinza. And then um, there's a couple other people that have never talked about it. So other than that, I, I've been the person that I had – tried to figure out what happened and dig deep into it. And then also I had another reason to do it is when I started dying, I it really upped the ante up for me to go all in to try to get some of this solved and get some help. So Right. And that's where the government actually stepped in and, and uh, covered your medical expenses, correct? No, ah, no, they didn't step in. They were forced. Um, <laughs> okay. Well. okay. And, what, and what I mean by that was it was a long process and it started with one senator's office where they uh, looked for my records and couldn't get them. And mm -hmm. then the aide that was working on that had dealt with other cases and came back and told me in a letter that my records were classified and I had to file for disability to expose the records inside the VA, which, which I did. And the VA would not grant access or the DOD would not even grant access to the um, the VA people trying to review my case, including the doctors, and they lied about my time in service. They actually came back and denied I was in from 79 to 82. And all my medical and personnel records, well, all my medical records from the time I came in until today are classified. And my personnel records from 79 to 82 were classified. So the Air Force didn't, was misleading about your time in the service? Yeah, um, it came back that they initially responded to Senator Kyle's office and said that the records weren't where they were supposed to be. So they pushed them harder. And what ended up happening was they released a few tidbits of my records and a few little pieces of my medical, but not my medical records, which we requested or my personnel file. And so we went forward with what was available for the disability and when i went in and explained to what the doctor had happened to me she just looked at me and said there's no way what you said happened could have happened you weren't even in the air force so my initial denial for my disability claim was that i wasn't in the air force from 79 to 82. wow do you think that that was uh intentionally uh stated to prevent uh the government for paying or having to pay for the um you know what you uh it, the damages or, or the uh, what you ex experienced you i think it was a combination of several things one they didn't want to admit to anything because the case had been made public years before so they they, they couldn't deny the incident took place they couldn't deny i was involved but they could try to cover up what happened to us and i was even told all along the way that there was no way that everybody involved within Kyle's office and Senator McCain's office um, told me that they were going to get me the care I deserve, but I was never going to know what happened to me. So we we went in with one hand tied behind our back. I mean, they went as far as when we would contact AFRPC, they denied that anything existed on me from 79 to 82. And it, it, it took a lot of work just to finally get them to acknowledge I was in from 79 to 82. And then when they did that, then they said, well, we'd already been denied and we had done an appeal. They said, deny the appeal and we'll relook at it f further to you know justify what happened to you. And they ended up, somebody pulled this, the, the plug and came back and said, thank you for denying the appeal and your case is now closed even though the agreement had been made through McCain's office that they would look at everything. So at that point, we went ahead and McCain got personally involved. Everybody got, uh, the whole staff got involved and got into this whole thing with them. We did an inspector general complaint. We um, we went ahead and filed that. We uh, They ended up 
bringing in somebody within the VA that had high clearance, and you can take this for what it's worth, he was denied access to my medical records also. Whoa. So they, they couldn't even, he couldn't even look at what happened. To yeah, I, I've heard that you're not even, no one's even allowed to dig into it anymore. Is that true? No one ever was, other than the people that were monitoring this over the years that, you know, were involved. And even to this day, my medical records are all classified. And I always like to shoot this out to people that listen. People say they can't do that. Yeah, they actually can. Uh, if you're in the military, even in the civilian side, they can try to do that. But if they declared a, a, a national, you know, a, a, the security event. But when you're in the military, if you're involved in an incident that's um, deemed national security, all your records can be classified. Sure. Absolutely. And even your medical records. And for me today with the VA, there's only a couple doctors that can handle my heart case and my eyes. That have been read they have access to those records. Yes, they would have limited access to the records and then and what's going forward. When I got sick with COVID, um, and I was in the hospital for four days, when I was you know how I don't know if people that were sick with COVID, but they usually do an echo on your heart and before you get out to see if there was heart damage from the COVID. Okay. The VA wouldn't the DOD wouldn't allow the hospital to do an echo. I had to go to a VA facility to have it done. I have a question. Was your DD-214 also classified? Yeah, they um they took a, a DD form 214 that was it was it was involved in um in something I did. I re-enlisted and they tried to push that off as my initial DD form 214, which anybody that looked at it knew it wasn't, but they've never ever even the one that they modified is a generic DD-4214. It's not what you would get for your 27 years in service. It was right. just they made up a generic DD-4214 and admitted I came in in March of 79. So they've hidden all the stuff that would be on a, a, a normal DD-4214. Hey, John. Hey. I'm sorry. Can you Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. John, um, question. With the DD-214, were you able to obtain a mortgage or anything like that for a housing purchase after that? Um, I, I, I was able to get a VA loan. Yeah, so I no did. no problems at all? Yeah, because they, they didn't deny I was ever in the military or a veteran. All they simply did was say I wasn't in from 79 to 82 when the okay. event happened. And okay. that was the thing was that's how we kind of got around it. Because it was very frustrating to talk to AFRPC and have the lady tell you that you're not, you weren't in. And so after the aide had tried, and then I called, I, I sat there for a couple of minutes and I go, wait a minute, I couldn't be retired if I didn't have those three years. So I called up retirements and that's how we started getting around stuff. So they actually were able to see that my records existed from 79 to 82. And they actually were able to certify enough proof to McCain's office. The lady helped me. I've been stationed with her. I, I When I called, I got the luck of the draw. I've been stationed at, with her at one of my bases. And she actually gave him enough documentation to force the DOD to acknowledge I was in from 79 to 82. But, again, they didn't give up any of my personnel records or my medical records. They just acknowledged in a generic DD form 214 that I did come in in March of 79. Didn't they also try to hide you, uh, the significant people in the UFO incident? Didn't they try to hide you in different countries? Well, actually, believe it or not, what happened, and this has got messed up too, but a lot of supposedly, and I say this supposedly because I don't remember it or do I know the people that left, other than the shift commander that was involved in night two disappeared right away. I remember she was gone right away. But Supposedly, some people that were involved got shipped out right away, but the main people didn't. But what happened was when the news of the world story broke, uh, myself, Colonel Hall, and General Williams were all shipped, shipped over to PACAF. Uh, I was at Kunsan, uh, I mean, sorry, Osan. Hall was at Kunsan, and, and uh, Williams was PACAF commander. And they put us over there because the press didn't have access to us. So the story broke, CNN got involved, and that, that kept the press from falling up and even CNN falling up after they uh, 
put out the four part series that they did about the incident, which was the most highly watched uh, special assignments they ever did. John, I, I do. I would like to for the viewers out there that don't know much about your story. Do you mind just giving us a little bit of information of leading into the story about the incident? Sure. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. It, it happened over a three night period. This was the event I was involved with and Colonel Hall was involved in this and a lot of other security police were involved. Um, there had been stuff that had happened prior to the event that we found out about over the years. There was stuff that happened after the event. So this wasn't just a one-off where even though it was strange, something would happen three nights in a row anyway, but there was stuff that had been going on over in that area for years prior, I guess. And then years afterwards, but we came on duty our last midnight shift at 2300 on Christmas night at about 300 on the 26th, which the dates always get screwed up. And even the halt memo had the wrong date in it when it started. But it started about 3 o'clock in the morning, 0300 on the 26th. And we uh, were, I was on patrol with my supervisor, and we saw he saw strange lights coming down from the sky into the forest. Asked me if I'd seen it. By the time I saw what he was looking at, it was in the forest. I said no. We drove off base briefly to see if we could get a better idea. When I got out of the car to, to, to peer into the forest, Things were weird. It was like time seemed to be slowing down, static electricity in the air. We drove back up to the gate, called it in on the phone. They sent a security team down. They verified the same. They saw what was going on. The shift commander made a decision after they verified through some radar sites that something had been seen on radar and something that came down in that forest area. So he made a command decision to send us out into the forest with the possible downed aircraft. So three of us took off into the forest. We uh, went so far on the service road, got out of our vehicle, went in on foot. Eventually, we came up over a berm where there was something there on the forest floor. It was like a bright light hit us. Um, it, it's and We hit the ground. What I remember was then it dimmed for a minute and then got bright again and took off into the sky and went out in, towards into the farmer's fields, out of the forest, towards the coast. Um, the, one of the guys that was with me just remembers we got close to something and we all blacked out. The other guy is the one that came out, Sergeant Penniston, and said that he had 45 minutes to walk around it, take notes, take pictures, touch it, get a binary download. All ha all that supposedly happened while we were, you know, close to it. But he had actually over the years had said that Ed was never with us, but now he's finally had to admit he was. And so there, there's a big discrepancy in what happened once we got close to it. We went out into the farmer's field, chased it towards the coast. We saw some lights down by these cottages, then out uh, in the sky uh, in front of the cottages. And that was night one, basically. When we got back, got called back to base, they lost radio contact with us for a while, too. When we got back to the party that was just outside the gate at the base, we noticed that our watches were 45 minutes slow. So that would have been night one. Night two, we were on break. Uh, the night the, the, the shift that took over D flight was on mids. They were on swings on our, our last mid. So they took over mids and somehow a bunch of stuff was seen. The shift commander was heading over for Betwaters or Woodbridge. The story goes that she was driving over there and a blue light came through her Jeep shut the Jeep down and she freaked out. So that's as much as that we got out of that. She actually freaked out, was relieved of duty. And there's a whole bunch of witnesses that when I did phenomena radio, we got them on and they talked about what happened. They saw that night. So that was night two. So night three was after I found out something happened on night two, I went ahead and was off, went over to the dorm that day, that morning, uh, that would have been Saturday morning. And had, I had some breakfast and went over to the dorm and talked to a couple guys I work with, you know, and I said, hey, they had something weird happen last night, too. So we decided to go out there that night on it for ourselves to um, see if we could figure out maybe what was going on. And when we got out there, that was the night Colonel Halt was out there with his team and his recording that's online you can listen to. And we eventually met up with Colonel Halt. And as I met up with him, 
and his team, there was a light that was in the distance that came down and was it kind of came towards the team. And he asked me personally, he said, Dad, did you see, was that what you saw on night one? And I said, I'm not close enough to say. So he let me and another guy who I didn't know at the time, but I later found out was his name was Adrian Bastenza. And we moved towards it. And as we were going towards it, it came closer to us. And as we were moving towards it, Adrian got went down to the ground and he claims that something knocked him down and held him. And, and what happened was I remember getting close to it and then it was gone. And what he said happened was I actually went into this and I disappeared. And, and why I went into it and I disappeared, part of it got onto, over onto his hand. And so it, it dissipated or, you know, disappeared. And as it disappeared, I reappeared. And so that was the night three incident. And those and Holt remembers that too. Holt denied it from the beginning that Adrian and I were ever involved. So we've got Holt to go as far now as, yeah, we were there. Yeah. We went in front of him. Yeah. He saw us. He didn't, he didn't remember seeing anything out of the normal, but it could have happened. Yeah. So exactly. I actually spent three with days this. with him. I spent three days with, uh, Holt in Roswell. And uh, that's why I was asking you because he does seem to be very, uh, it's kind of like a, about him, you know, um, the way. Well, it, and it's fair. Uh, he was the Colonel. And I mean, I've never had a problem with him being the go-to guy for this. He was a United States Colonel out there, but my biggest problem was that he lied about Adrian and I, and he lied about our involvement, tried to discredit what we, what happened to us, what we saw. You think that was due to his position? His rank? Well, there's been all kinds of speculation, but one of the biggest pieces that stood out was they were trying to cover that part up because right. there's other right. evidence. Because I disappeared. We had an encounter with something that I actually disappeared into. And can you imagine if that was admitted to by the United States Air Force? Yeah, but they would cover it up anyway, right? They buried it just like a health. Well, record. that's how they buried it, though. I mean, they basically it went quiet. It didn't come out. I think what was it? It happened in eighty, and I don't think it hit the news of the world till eighty three, if I remember right, or eighty four. So they kept it. It got leaked out. Something happened, and there were people looking at it. But until the memo came out, there was nothing official from the government. United States Air Force a minute it happened. And once the memo got out through Freedom of Information Act, they were in a pickle because they were stuck with a memo from United States Colonel saying that something happened outside an Air Force base over three nights. And he kind of misconstrued right. that. And there were people involved in it. And, so let me ask you, know, so let me ask you this, right? So there were three nights. The, the, the service government would not spend the time or money to send people out three different nights if something hadn't happened. I mean, that's a, that's a, well, no the, well, yeah, but the first night was what I said was that they thought something crashed right. night two, the shift commander had her interaction going between bases. So no one was sent out into the force, but you're right. Night three, they sent a team out there because this was as Hall's own words was, this was getting out of hand. And, yep. and they wanted to try to get a, a better explanation for what was going on. If there, if there was one moment that, resonates with you what would be was it on night one night two or night three like if there's that one moment that you go but the biggest problem i have is both on night one and three i don't when i got close to it i can't tell you anything more but i would probably say <clears throat> night one was interesting just in the way it like kind of teased us in the forest was moving around and stuff but night three was, it, I, I, I left feeling different. But the other thing was, and I wish I had a doll for every time people said, even I said it at the time, that couldn't be our stuff for sure. Um, that what we saw, we couldn't explain. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's just no way what we had seen in my, especially my short military career. I saw airplanes, helicopters. I yeah. never saw something in the forest doing what, was going on yeah, or in the sky. A couple of things that kind of triggered me because in, in our case, you know, I, when, when this happened to us, we felt like we were underwater. We felt like we were muted. We felt placid. We had these tapping sounds and then there was a flash. Uh, the wildlife went still. You didn't hear any crickets, any birds or anything. And then all of a sudden, bang, it was like it was over. And I was wondering, like you had said that you fell to the ground and, and I'm just wondering if, if what took place 
is uh, as uh, mirrors what happened to us as much as I think it did because I think didn't did this affect the wildlife? Did it affect? Well, yeah. On night one, we could hear the animals in the forest, and halt on night three on his tape. He says the animals have gone deaf and quiet now. So, but actually, I didn't fall down. It was Adrian that went to the ground. So. Just so and why did he go to the ground? He said he but, felt something pushed him down and held him. When like the a object, yeah, he That's said that I'm when it came out, it's in the book. He just he wrote up uh, three or four pages about what he remembered happening and like the yeah, weaponization identify everything. But he said that in the book he talks about what happened to us and we went forward. And it's interesting that, as far as I know. There's some questions about at least one other person, but it had nothing to do with what I went through. Um, and then what I helped Adrian with, Adrian and I are both, the government admitted the incident took place. We uh, are getting VA medical care for it and disability for what happened to us. So that is a big deal in the fact that the government, and I always try to clarify this, they eventually admitted I was in the Air Force, that I was involved in the event, that uh, why I was involved in the event, I was injured in the event. But what they've never done is then take it further and say what we were exposed to or what happened to us. So there's nothing in your public military records that would indicate the incident. Um, in that well, that's all locked down. And, and and there's another thing I haven't talked about for a long time. But when I was uh, in the Air Force, I went TDY to Maxwell Air Force Base. And down there, that's where they keep the archives. And you could go into the archives. And when I was down there for the two months, I went in and went in and requested the wing history for December of 1980. And so I had to come back the next day. And actually, I, I requested the wing history for 80, 1980, because they did it by that way. And when it brought it out to me um, the next day, December of 1980 was missing. <laughs> Convenient. Oh, and the guy went quite crazy because he was like a GS-14. So I went to the lady. I said, where's December? And she's like, oh, I don't know. And I go, well, there's a problem. You can't tell me. It should be. It should say why it's missing, right? She goes, sir, sir, I, 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 let me get you to my supervisor, my boss. Go have a seat over there. And he came over and sat down. And he says, what can I do for you? And I said, well, Explain what happened in December of 1980. He just looked at me and he said, um, I can't. And I go, why? And he goes, well, why do you want to know? I said, I was stationed there and something happened in that time. And he goes, they do this every time. Something like that happens and they pull the file and they don't give oh, us any yeah. guidance on how to answer answer why it's not there. And I looked right. at him. I had to take him for his word. So, Hey, John. But, go ahead. John, can you tell us some of the um, medical problems that you experienced with the close, close encounter? Yes, physical and mental. Well, I didn't really have, other than, like I said, I have no memory of getting close to it both times. But it never, a lot of people that were involved in this said it affected them mentally. They had issues with it, nightmares and stuff. Um, I, I, over the years, I may have had a few times where I had some weird dreams, but I wasn't like traumatized by the event mentally. But what happened to me was right after the event, I started not feeling well. And in the summer, when I got stationed back in the States, I didn't, I got sick over a weekend when I was home on my days off, had to go to the emergency room at the local hospital. That's what you have to do in the military. You just can't call in sick or whatever. So the doctor, I had to go to the emergency room and he checked me out and he asked me what, what the Air Force thought about my heart murmur. And I just looked up at him and I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have heart problems. He says, yeah, you do. And so he wrote up, he wrote it all up. Um, and uh, I went back to the base on Monday. And when I showed up, when I went into the hospital and I had to go to the oily room, you know, to show that the doctor said I was sick and I was off couldn't work um they actually told me not to work on monday night they said there's a doctor coming in from wright patterson to look at you on tuesday so i went in and saw him on tuesday and he checked me over told me to go home go home pack my bags there'll be orders issued for me to go tdy to wright patterson the next day and so i went up there and uh they did a ton of tests 
And in the afternoon, he came back. He told me to pack a bag to stay for a while. But in the afternoon, when he came back in, he just said to me, he said, hey, um, what I thought might be the problem exactly wasn't it. You're not going to have to have immediate surgery right now. He said, but we're going to have to continue to monitor this. And that's one of the big things I think that's classified. And if you go into the book, there was a guy that showed up later that helped me get my settlement. It was a CIA guy by the name of Christopher Green. Anyway, um, he spelled out, and it's in the book, about uh, above top secret exactly what he knew about the event and what injured me and everything else. So he had a really good knowledge of what we were exposed to and what happened to us. And um, so then I also had eye problems. And what I found out is I've got eye damage with – that was they feel is something to do with lasers and i've got a hole in my right eye eye wall so that that's all there that they're constantly monitoring too yeah. so i actually went on fox prime time and talked with jesse waters about my eye problems i've had five eye surgeries myself and that is one of the main things that uh i've got uh i have to had uh I, my eyes will will go out of focus yeah whatever happens, I give me a prescription and then three to four weeks later, that prescription's no good and my eyes will either randomly get better or switch or change. So I've got what's called a lazy eye issue. It's not like a lazy eye, like the eye walk, you know, shifts around on you, but my eyes will not adjust to a particular prescription. I've had five eye surgeries. They've had to put these uh, lenses in my eyes to block out certain like blue lighting in that or whatever it is, you know, like to, to knock right. out UV because the little, the little, I have to wear glasses or, or sunglasses 24 seven to knock out light. I mean, and, and, and it's, I've had, like I said, I've gone to, I've had laser su surgery. I've had so many surgeries that they can't work on my eyes anymore. Nothing they can well, do to fix it. Yeah. Nothing. Mine, mine, mine was, hasn't been that extreme. I, I just had some issues why afterwards where I was having some vision issues and some weird stuff in my eyes then I went and saw a, the eye doctor at Luke. They sent me to Wolfer Hall right away, saw a top colonel. And that was the interesting thing about that was he, it was, this was all stuff that I didn't contribute to Bentwaters. He goes to me when he's looking in my eyes, he says, have you been exposed to radiation? And yeah. I, I looked at him and I said, not that I'm aware of. It was but the same the, question they asked me, by the way. Yeah. But the interesting part about it was I was due to go to Korea then in October. And he said, I wasn't physically fit. No to be in Korea with the lack of medical facilities they had over there. And he actually went in as a full bird colonel and told the DOD I couldn't go. The DOD overruled him, and he sent me to Korea anyway. My eyes are basically cooked. Interesting. Cooked was one of the words they used. Kind of no, like I can't. I've got – my biggest issue is the focus sometimes, but yeah. I, have, um, I have a hole in my eye wall. It's been yeah, scarred. Too. That's why the light, I have to wear these all the time because the light gives me a headache. It's too piercing. Well, yeah, I haven't, I haven't had what that. Do you what is it? Like, what do you Well, think? if you go back and look at the book, it, we were exposed to terahertz radiation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's stuff radiation. that can damage. Yeah, but it's not the type of radiation you would think. Everybody always tried to attribute to uh, nuclear weapons and stuff. No, right. that's yeah. not that type of uh, um, radiation. Terahertz is a distinct different type of radiation that's used in weapon, weapons. It's used in, okay, like, for example, when you go through that scanner at the airport, you know, the one that can see you naked, basically, <laughs> that's terahertz radiation. Um, is that it, the one that you do this? Yeah, yeah that's, they use terahertz radiation in that. It can see through walls, but it can also do a lot of other stuff when you combine it with different things like lasers and, um, and uh, uh, plasmas and stuff like that. So it's that's what we discuss in the book. That that's why it's called weaponization. They were that area were right outside the back gate, which I didn't know about, and I doubt if anybody else did. Even the base itself may not have known, other than maybe the top staff knew that they were doing research there. Was the uh, equivalent to our Area Fifty One? They right. developed outside on the coast there. Um, they developed, that's where they first developed radar. That's where they first developed the death ray, which is lasers. And then they developed radar off of that. They were doing all kinds of um, testing and stuff. They were working outside the back gate on SDI at the time. And people say, 
No, SDI didn't happen until after Reagan. No, no, no. They were working on SDI in the 60s and 70s. So right. all this was taking place right outside the gate. And with and money we, that was used for the space race. Well, not, not only that, but it was black money that had been moved overseas because if you remember back then, that was MK Ultra was going on, the Vietnam Papers. So Congress was taking over and shutting everything down. So they moved it all the black money and they moved all the technology testing out over to England. Right. Because it was it. black projects. Yeah, under Marconi. And if you read what Green said, one of the reasons why my records are classified is because it ties in to uh, SAP programs. Wasn't that at Orford Ness? Yes, Orford Ness, yeah. Okay. And Mar Marl from Heath, Aria Bowsey, um, and then Eastern Radar was there, and Neistad was there, and there was, and, and they were using um, uh, the Elephant Tower up at Chick Sands. I don't know if you knew what that was, but that was what they used to do communications and listening stuff. And all this stuff was being worked on, including drones, including um, they were working on drones, lasers, um, and what else were they? Working? There was something else they were working on. I forget. I'd have to weren't, go back there, and look. weren't there a lot of scientists that had mysterious deaths? That yeah. happened after the event. There was some Marconi. It was Marconi at the time was the company, the RAF company, or the British company that was the one leading the project. They died mysteriously, yes, after our event. There's like five or six of them. And it was attributed to that the Russians may have knocked them off because we were we were getting ahead of them in that technology. And, but at one time, Russia was ahead of us with plasma technology, correct? They were working on it. Who knows how far they were ahead of us? I don't. You know, there's been speculation they were. I don't know. But, I mean, it was a race for this technology. And if you really go back, that is the beginning of, what I don't know if you guys saw the article about a month ago now, where the Joint Chief says the warfare is going to change in the next decade. You won't recognize it because of technology. Yeah. But that was the beginning of that right back there and prior. That's where they were all working on this. And the kicker to all this, you say, how does this have to do with UFOs? There's a UA, there is a um, a phenomenon or anomaly there that is not just there, but in other places in the world including like Skinwalker, Bradshaw Ranch, and Sedona. And they, the, the British government was aware of this and they were studying it. The Skinwalker phenomenon. Yeah, it's a, it's a phenomenon. It's, it, it's an energy field. It's an energy field that's connected around the world. And you can pretty much, and I'm saying this only in the fact that there are weak spots in different areas that you could almost attribute to it like a wormhole or something. Yeah, it and it's that. very intelligent, from what I understand. Yeah, you just have to read Project Condon. Phenomenon is yeah, very yeah. smart. And it, it's but there's declassified kind of interacting. Yeah, but there's declassified documents that no one wants to take seriously from the British government. They did a study on this. They got it declassified, and they openly admitted that it exists. That I've Tom, you saw me do presentations about it from the, the yeah. actual declassified documents. Yeah. And my, it's my there it ties to the space race and all this stuff too. So this resonates with me a lot. And and even you know, and even we had the even Skinwalker. I mean, we had uh, Chris. Uh, Chris was on here. I can't remember his last name. And uh, he was talking. He had seen things right in front of him unfold. And you so about blood cell? No, 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 not Chris. But he lives not not far from me. Um, Chris, uh, Chris. Um, I don't know. I'm looking. Yeah, well, yeah, I know. Good guy, by the way. They wouldn't yeah. let me go to Skinwalker. They wouldn't let me go to Skinwalker. Yeah, I don't. I can see why. They. I tried. I tried to get up there. Nolan Kelleher, Bigelow, all those guys wouldn't let me go up to Skinwalker. I got but a question for you. I'm sorry. If it's man-made, if it's man-made, portal. It's both. It's both. Or if it's organic. It's both. Bigelow. It's Bigelow. A testing ground, from what I understand. But no, Bigelow told the truth when he said they're here among us. It's it's sure. it may not be the whole answer to what UFOs are, but right. it, I yeah. think the reason why they separated this, there's been different explanations, but there is an unidentified phenomenon yeah. that they're using, or they call it unidentified, that they know a lot more about it than they're willing to admit. But there isn't an, a, an energy type phenomenon. That very well, and this is where people lose you real fast, that ties to consciousness itself. It could right. tie to the earth 
um, the Shannon and Renaissance, you know, the energy field of the earth itself, and it could all be tied into all that. And if you want to go to the divine field and consciousness itself, but it, there is an intelligent phenomenon that's energy based that mm -hmm. they're working on and, and it involves plasmas and, and stuff and it's real. And, and they've had it in different parts of the world. And the interesting thing is, is when this stuff starts happening, guess what's one of the first things that ha has to happen before this stuff starts showing itself? Control the media. No, ra radars. Yeah, well, control the media too. Well, no, but they start, control they start, the media. They start working on, yeah. in these areas, they have radar sites. And these radar sites start to draw this phenomenon out and it becomes more prevalent. One thing I'm going to say real quick, the answer to Tom's question is Christopher O'Brien. There you go. And Christopher also mentioned uh, this energy force, okay? Mm -hmm. And he said it goes back to like 1601. It's documented all the way back to 1601 in, in history about this energy force interacting with cattle, interacting with animals, cattle mutilations, other things. Yeah. It's interesting happening. enough, but I'm doing a show right now on the UNX network that I'm working with some people and we're doing a history of it. And that was in the first one we did on, and it's on YouTube that we right. talked about the history and all this stuff. Yeah. We yeah, it is. Yeah. It was way back. Yeah. By the way, I yeah. think, I think um, Bigelow had said, actually um, they're right below our feet. I think was one of the quotes that he had said. I just remember the 60 minutes piece when he said they're here among us yeah. and the, the lady just stared at him and didn't say, yeah, why look in space? They're already here. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But she didn't follow up and say, who's they that's yeah, right. there's just times when you just wonder when you've got a guy of that magnitude saying that, why didn't you ask him yeah. a couple? No follow -up questions. questions really? Yeah. Yeah. I had to backtrack into that one. Uh, maybe she was so shocked she couldn't speak. That, that's a possibility. Uh, one thing I'm going to say is when we interviewed Christopher O'Brien, he said a portal that was 65 feet tall, about 50 to 60 feet wide opened up, and a 40-foot a triangle flew through it. Now, what I've always wondered is, is that ours or theirs? Well, see, I can't go into what he said. All I can tell you is this. If – this is part of the history of my case. When I met these people, Hal put off, uh, who's who did well, I'll just go into the papers. McCain right. got involved after Kyle retired, and he was on the judiciary or not judiciary, but the committee that does funding for weapons, weapons and stuff, right? I forget the name of the committee, but he he was a senior senator. And as soon as I got my settlement and he was involved with it, this group that part of two the stars, but Justice Mellon put off Green and all those guys. They did a presentation to his committee. And if you remember the 38 declassified DIA documents yes. that, that were declassified, right? Well, if you go and look at them, they talk about wormholes in it. They talk about interstellar travel to include creating a warp field. Um, they talk about time dilation. And that's pretty much, we're pretty sure that's what happened to me. I went into a time dilation bubble. So, so, and that would cause effects and it would, and the finger of that time dilation bubble is, is terahertz radiation. Is that why your jaw and, or your gum lines turned white? I don't know. That was just something weird that happened afterwards. Now my gums bled for about a week. It was weird. So did you have any psychological like issues after all of this? Like, okay, you, you mentioned like nightmares. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? I don't know. Other people had nightmares. They There's some people that clearly have PTSD from it or they claim they do. And what I'm saying is I'm not saying they don't. They just say they do. So I'm not a doctor, so I can't evaluate them whether they do or don't. But what I'm getting at is I didn't have the mental issues i had the physical issues and the thing was is that uh, i mean it was tough but it it didn't it didn't like drive me for years what kept it going in my life was that stuff started leaking out and it, you know people start talking about it so i always wanted to make sure early on that my story was correct hey so I got thrown into it, including when it broke, I had to get briefed by the Pentagon on what I could say and couldn't say. Oh. And yeah. stuff. So I actually 
when it all broke, they were chasing me all over CNN called and were coming out to going to the interview me. And I told them no. And DeCaro ended up being friends with later said, well, we don't take no for an answer. And we actually have permission to interview you. So I went to public affairs, dropped the whole thing on them. Next day, I know I'm getting called when I'm coming on to work. I got called into the battle staff area and had to talk on a secure line to the Pentagon about what exactly was going on and what I couldn't, couldn't say and what went so on. I got two questions. So um, being that you're an American, but you were overseas, was who, what country has put the most restrictions on you? Well, it's interesting. If you read the book, we got some very, I got some very interesting responses from FOIA from the British government right. to include the fact that they admitted they were working on UAP technology. I asked them point blank based off of, I got a document from the CIA guy that helped me get my surgery, but I learned some stuff from it. And I went after the British government for FOIA and they openly admitted, I posted one of the other responses they got back that they wouldn't talk about, but they openly admitted they were working on UAP technology for weaponization, but they wouldn't tell any more about it because it, they gave a whole list of why, but but our government, when we did our FOIA with them, the State Department admitted they were involved, but they couldn't release what they knew because it belonged to other units. And when we contacted the other units, they denied they had paperwork on it. Mm -hmm. So, so America basically strong arm took control of the whole thing and oversaw what you could and couldn't do. Well, I mean, it basically involved us. So, yeah. and what people don't understand was that this is a misconception about that base too. We were a NATO base. We weren't an American base. We weren't an English base. And what we could not couldn't do or have weapons or what we did there was tied to NATO. It had nothing to do with the treaty with the United Kingdom or the United States. And we were had a NATO TACA valve every year. So when they come back and say we couldn't have nukes, we couldn't do this, we couldn't do that, that was not true. You could go and do the research and see what you could and couldn't do under NATO treaty. And it was pretty wide open what they could and couldn't do. So, I got another question for you. So someone had told me about a, maybe a month or so ago that some pictures came out and with you and others, and there was a CIA agent in these photos that were later identified. Do you know, have you heard anything about that? Okay. All right. I can go into it just from this standpoint. Okay. okay. There was somebody that came forward and stated they were involved with picking us up on the different nights and and taking us to this doctor. They called him the doctor in the white coat. And I'm just not going to use that person's name, not because I don't want I, I just I they they talk about it, but they don't really want any more attention drawn on there onto them. But what was interesting was was that they described this person in a way that was like, whoa, wait a minute. This, I know somebody that looks a little bit like that that's older. And what I did was I took a picture and I there were four people in it. And I just said, hey, take a look at this picture. And is that person, you? it was a picture of this person when they were young. And they took a look at it and they picked this CIA guy out. And then what happened next was Adrian Bastinza was also remembered this doctor and I gave him the same picture and he picked the same guy out. So, and the particular guy in is Christopher green. So they both claim that he was there. Richard Doty claimed he was there. And the other interesting thing was he openly admitted to halt and I both in writing that he was involved with the memo and how it was distributed. So, I mean, I, I don't remember him. Right. So, but now, were, these, were these pictures from day one, day two, or day three? No, the pictures of the guy was from a different, of something different. Oh, okay. He was with three other people that was, they were standing by an airplane. And I just simply said, the person you're describing, is he in this picture? Right. But and had, they, had, yeah. had, but had been in the same circles of what was going on. and Yeah. So, that was how that person was identified. Hall was the one running around that made a big deal about it. Yeah, that's where I heard it from. Okay. Um, guys, we got to take a short intermission here to uh, um, highlight our sponsor. So here it is. <laughs> 
Did you know 75% of Americans are chronically dehydrated? If you struggle with focus, run low on energy, or when it's time to finally sleep, you simply can't, this can all be linked to dehydration. And Fuel Up has the answer. Our proprietary formula contains the finest cellular hydration with the strongest immune enhancing natural ingredients. The Fuel Up system is made up of three different incredibly tasting varieties. Wake, kickstart your day with a jolt of caffeine. Play, boosts focus while hydrating your cells. Rest, not only helps you relax, but also rejuvenates your cells while you sleep. Here's what our clients have to say. I really don't miss my coffee, and you can tell the difference. So I'm gonna take it for the energy, I'm gonna take it for the play, I'm gonna take it you know, all day. And it works, that's the thing, it works. We love it. Take the Fuel Up Challenge now, where we offer a feel the difference money back guarantee. Fuel Up for This is Race Hobbs from the Unex Network. Join the journey on YouTube at UFO Man. Saturday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, you can unlock the truth with UFO Man, Tim Dust, Tom Reed, and Rhiannon Alley. Buckle up. It's sure to be a great ride. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you to our sponsors uh, for sponsoring the channel. That's both UFO Expo and uh, Fuel Up. So thank you. Um, I wake myself. Yeah. I love it. I'm drinking it every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, this orange sherbet is so delicious. Yeah. So yeah, we're such my, my my favorite too, actually. Um, anyways, good. let's get back into the yeah. thick of things with uh, John. Um, I got a question. Okay. All right. So you, when you uh, wrote your book, did you go back to the location, or did you kind of just have you ever been back? I guess to the the spot and actually walk the same steps that you took, you know, day one, day two, and day three. And if so, do you have any? Uh, physical feelings from that. Like when I go back to where this happened with me, my hair will stand up in my arms. I, my mouth gets dry. I mean, I still, to this day, even though I act as if it doesn't really bother me, if I go to ground zero, it does. Well, I went back more than once, but the one that we went back for was the 30th anniversary. We were over there for several days. Okay. We were filming with Prometheus Entertainment, which they used some of it on ancient aliens. And then, they were also going to do a documentary that never took place. But we were back over there. That's when Penniston and I went back over there. And we actually kind of were pretty sure where we were. You know, we went together. Now, the interesting thing about that was he really, he'd been back before that and took everybody to a, a completely place that was way off base, just off the statements and stuff. He made it sound like he just went right out the gate and took a right. Well, the statements even talk about us looking down into the forest. But anyway, we went back over there, and it was a weird feeling. We were out there at night. We were out there during the day. So, yeah, it was a little strange being back over there, um, you know, going back over the, the grounds where it all happened. Then went back over another time, and we actually tried to walk the route from right. where the gate, where we got out, drove, got out, went. There's just no way what I remember we were. And it's in the book. It describes where we went. And How everything. far was Ground Zero from the actual base itself? Ground Zero was, that was where we drove and then walked. And we could have got that out easily. But where we ended up on the coast was a couple miles, I think, three miles. Okay. But the actual event where we first had our encounter was maybe a half a mile, a mile. I don't know. Do you know what I'm getting at? But, um. But it wasn't that far off. But it was where we remembered ending up that there's just no way we could have gotten out there and back. Where you, you know? ended up on day three? No, on night one. 
Night one. Okay. Yeah, night one. Oh, were there light one beams one. coming into the base too? I mean, was there some talk about? Well, Hall talked about beams of light going into the WSA. Um, there was on his tape. He talks about a beam of light coming down from his feet. But we've kind of figured that out. That was probably lasers that they were using to control the plasmas that were the blue lights in the sky. We've kind of put this a lot of this together. It's in the book that we've uncovered declassified documents and stuff. And we've put together the technology being worked on and how it would have been used and everything else during our event to include bringing down the satellite that they were using all this technology to bring down a Russian spy satellite. So did you ever see ground markings? Yeah, there were some indentations, but if you do the research on plasmas, that's how they were created. We probably had an interaction with the plasma in the forest. And what's interesting is if you look at it, these plasmas can be affected by radar beams and they can have a life of their own too. And lasers can control them. So they can move around. It says in Condine, they can move around. They can be appear to be under intelligent control. They can uh, they can create effects like indentations in the ground. So but these plasmas are, is it something that's like a round ball type of thing, or is this kind of like that picture you had in your intro, like you know that orangish thing so or bluish what stuff like that? The path now as to what they say would, like would be. That? That. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly what quite what. I drew like the orange type of oval object in my mm -hmm. statement. That looks a lot like it. Yeah. And, but there were blue lights in it and around it and stuff. Was it as broken up as that or was it more defined? Um, I'd say it was about like that. I mean, okay. we're talking 40 years, so I'm not going to try to, you know. What about the um, the trail that has the, uh, the depiction? The, I believe it's uh, you have a picture of that, Tim. Can you put that up? What the picture what, of what? What is said to have been the craft from that night? Yeah. Oh, that was yeah, they did different companies have tried to describe it. No, that's not what I remember now. This is what's in the park, I guess. Yeah, they made that off the triangle object of finishing this guy. Yeah, it's good. I've been to it, I've seen it, yeah. <laughs> So they went off the triangular uh, markings in the ground too, which I think Tim just put up, right, Tim? Yeah, that yeah, that was the drawings he said he made. Yeah. So the this is much different than what Halt and you say you saw. I can't, you know, Halt. I don't ever remember him describing definitively other than the blue lights, okay, and stuff and the different colored lights. He's never really described like a craft or anything, and. I've always over the years struggled with it, but my drawing in my statement, you know, is what I remember. And the, the, if you look at the drawing, it had like a triangular, but that was the white light that was uh, emanating within the white reddish light that was emanating within. So that was more of a, uh, like a bright light rather than a physical object. Yeah, I don't, I used the word object under hypnosis and I've used the word object sometimes trying to describe it, but mm -hmm. no, I don't remember seeing a triangular object or anything like that. Yeah. No, if you're um, also in his eighties now too, right? He's pretty old right now. He's right? up in his eighties. If I remember yeah. right. Yeah. Through, through your hypnosis, did you have any uh, recall on what happened to you when you disappeared? Well, I'm not going to go too deep into that because if you think the binary gets weird, then this my hypnosis takes it to a different level. Um, what I could tell you is I do relive it. We get to a point where I'm having an interaction with it. Um, I've said this before, so I'll say it again. Um, while I was under hypnosis and I've had government people look at it, and they say I was having an interaction real time under hypnosis with whatever this phenomenon was. Wow. I was going to, you know, Tim, it was funny. I was just thinking about the whole hy hypnosis thing. And how just so, John, how easy was it for you to go into hypnosis? Because I think about hypnosis and I'm like, oh, yeah, they can't hypnotize me. That was done. It was done. It's a very strange way it was done both times. But if. The hypnosis, the guy that did it was a trained police officer that was involved in this type of stuff. But he put me under by, he couldn't put me under at first, but he put me under by coming right over me like this and he put me out. It was really weird. It's right on the tape. I'm not going under. 
he tells me to sit back and he runs his hand across me like this and goes like this. And I went out just like that. So That's amazing. So there might be something to the, the pineal gland or whatever that they were able to activate. He was able to activate. Um, the second time I went under, she did a different technique, but she got me to a point where I felt like I was going into a wormhole and it, I was blocked by these blue lights and there was a face there. And um, I actually was levitating off the couch. My body was lifting a little bit off the couch. It was up off the couch a little bit. Wow. You're muted, Tim. Sorry. Well, I said, wow, that might actually be residual from your encounter. You know, I, residual. Energy. I've always been very careful to separate hypnosis from what I remember because right. there's a lot of um, controversy when it comes to hypnosis. But I will tell you this, the government approached me to do have me be involved in a hypnotic study that they're working on on people that they verified have been involved with UAP incidents. They wanted me to participate in that and I told them no. So did they hey, video did you have any video going on while you were going through your hypnosis? Yeah, I've got video of both, yeah. So you were able to look at it after the fact and go, whoa, that well really when happened. I came out of my first hypnosis in 88 Everybody in the room was just staring at me with their mouth open with what took place. They were just like, what, uh, you know, and it was yeah. kind of like, what? And then I did watch it, but it is very strange. And it's very strange the way I interacted with supposedly the phenomenon itself and everything else. So, and in my tape, it's, there's a little clip of it on YouTube. You can watch, but um, it says they're coming back for me eventually. Do you Why remember any occupants? Sorry. What? Do you remember any occupants? Any the, blue light? lights, the blue lights were actually the entities. They were the actual life forms, is what it says in my hypnosis. And That's how this... the tape kind of ends. What What are the blue lights? They're the life form. And the blue lights came from the plasma. It came from the orangish ball, right. well, which probably would plasma. be the plasma. Yeah, the main plasma ball. Yeah. And that was hot, too, then. The plasma? Yeah. I, I don't I don't ever never touched it or nothing like that, so I have no idea. Okay. Okay. So it's an That's energy it. field primarily. Yeah, it, it's yeah. And it can be created, they can create man-made plasmas, they can do all this, and they can do this off of the energy field itself. Then you actually have the real phenomenon itself okay. that they're studying and working on. This was all going on, this is all documented. Right. This is not like made up stuff. Like, well, I'm going back to the eyes. Like, it's a plasma, and you've got an energy, and we've got eye damage, and th th this all looks like a form of radiation type of thing. So it's it does terror. Like it would have been it's quite terror. It's it's body. not. It's terror's radiation. That that if you look at what Green said in Above Top Secret, it's in the book. That frequency is terahertz radiation that caused mm -hmm. the damage. So, which is a radio frequency, I believe. Um, don't get put me on the spot because yeah. I'll screw it up. It's but like you can, but there's different forms of terahertz radiation. It's not mm -hmm. just one type. There's different forms of sure. it and stuff. And if this is a fact, okay, prior to me meeting these guys, prior to them helping me, terahertz was not being talked about. And they turned around and put terahertz on the map, and they were doing they were doing a DNA study on. 100 people i was involved in that study i eventually agreed to because they got my they got my dna anyway when they did the surgery they actually got um tissue they when they did the surgery the government took it so they have that um the reason why i lived i, I should have died out there but in your heart the valve has two leaflets well my particular leaflet i had two leaflets on the inside of my heart so the damage to those leaflets, which is very rare, if ever, was took place, which is why the civilian doctors couldn't figure it out. But once the CIA showed up, he gave the, the DOD what they needed to look at to correct the problem. But ultimately, because of the two leaflets, they they stayed together. One leaflet that would have probably died out there when it happened. So, so yeah, but it, yeah, and it, it's there. And again, people get mad and say, 
Well, that doesn't explain everything. And I'm not trying to tell you it is. I'm just trying to say, this is what we understand about Rendlesham. This is how we understand it's being utilized by the government to weaponize stuff. You want to know why the, the uh, intelligence agencies aren't cooperating? You want to know why Congress is getting the brush off and they're not even being asked for funding? Because they're not going to expose to the other countries of the world what we have and how we're utilizing it, where we're going with it. It says right in my FOIAs, we are not going to tell you because it involves technology that would benefit the enemy if they understood what we were doing. Technology is power. power. Censorship, censorship systems. Not censorship. Uh, That's not what I meant. Um, Identifying things um, like... um, uh, what's the term? Well, well, you know, having having something that somebody else doesn't have is is, you know, technology is is power and power is money and power is control. So that's all about control. I mean, yeah, I didn't mean censorship. I meant censors. Right. Yeah, I know what you mean. Radar governing. systems. There's a, govern, there's a governing in place. Yeah, but if you remember, do you guys remember what Von Braun warned before he died? He uh, said no. there there will be a UFO event, but it'll be false because all it really ties to is weaponization of space. Well, Mm -hmm. what have we done? We've created the space force. It's a new part of the military that all this stuff is being locked down into the space force, the Navy, the army, the air force, they're not getting access to this stuff. No, instead we're shooting down down balloons with $400,000 missiles. Well, that's a story for another day. (laughs) It goes back. It goes back to star Wars. Huh? But that's what was going on it right outside the back gate. Back to Star Wars. That was a prelude to what is to come. Right? It goes back to radar. No, it goes back to the development of EM frequencies and radars and uh, um, lasers and stuff. And and actually identifying there's a phenomenon there that they're they're studying to actually weaponize. But when it all comes down to it, it's all tied up in SAP programs that only a limited amount of people have access to, including Congress, whether they want to, they act like they're the gods, but they're idiots. And I've, I've, I've interacted <laughs> with some of them. They act like they have the right to know. Well, maybe in theory, by in a democracy, they do, but that's not the way the national security state. Yeah, they don't, need, have, they don't right. have any business. They have no business just because they had a better campaign and got an office. Well, and, think- and what people need to understand, do you remember how Harry Reid came out afterwards and said this should be made public, right? Do you know what his first reaction was when he gave money to Bigelow and they started looking into this? His very first reaction was they wanted to lock this all down in an SAP program. That was his okay. own words. We need to put this in an SAP program. So question, um, and maybe you might know, this might be something for the viewers. Why do you think Bigelow sold Skywalker Ranch? Or Skinwalker? Skinwalker? Skinwalker Ranch. Why do you think he sold it? I, I Probably they got what they needed out of it and they didn't need it anymore. And he did want to be involved with you know, it once it became a popular place, everybody kind of wanted to go there, you know. So that's a liability issue and then trying to secure the place and everything else. But I, from what I understand, the government's running it now. So. Everything's so compartmentalized, you know. Yeah. yeah. Whether like, you agree with it or not, we can make fun of it. But that's the way. But if you want to go back in history, go back to what Eisenhower warned us about. The, he warned us about the actual industrial military complex was going to take over. Kennedy came on board and tried to fight some of that. Whether they killed him or not is up for debate, but he did get killed. And then ever since then, this whole program has been rolling forward with the weaponization of the people. And if you really want to get scared, I'll tell you listeners to go watch a show right now that just came out. It's called The Rabbit Hole with Keith Sutherland. And yeah. it's on, um, what is it, on Amazon? Um, but it's their show four, but they're laying out where AI is going to take us and yeah. how, how this is going to happen. And if you look at what Musk and everybody's warned us about, AI oh, yeah. may take over everything. And this show lays out how it's happening and what's happening to us. And yeah. it does tie back into some of what's going on with UAPs to include they're working on stealth. 
They're working on cloaking. They're working on teleportation. They're working on um, um, yeah. telepathy. They're working they on all doing that. Time travel. They're working on all this stuff. Yeah, but time travel is a little different. It's not time travel yet. It's time dilation. You right. could go into a bubble and you're still there in that time frame, but you're in a different type of time zone or dilation of time, which right. is what they can do with these tanks. Let's say you could create a bubble over it and the weapon would go through it because yeah. it's not in the same in, time. And in theory, we actually already time traveled. There was that Russian astronaut who didn't he, he lost like a, a second or two. Remember that? Yeah, but the real time travel is where they try to say you go back. See, we yeah, technically yeah. we oh, lost yeah. forty when we went in a time dial time time dilation bubble. We lost forty five minutes. It okay. changed. It's like the best way to explain it is when Interstellar came out. They kind of laid out what it would be like to be in a different type of time time freak thing, and it would okay. slow time down. Like they were on the planet, and they thought they were two days and 15 years above the planet. They were circling it. They actually aged 15 years from what they were on the planet, but they only thought they were two days. That's kind of what time dilation is. Now, you could step that up, but here's the key, which most people don't want to look at because they think it's hokey pokey, but the government funded it for years. It was Stargate, and Stargate was remote viewing. Mm -hmm. And remote viewing could oh, go. Yeah, totally they could, they could go. They could go different places, including looking at the future. Right. I've been part of that actually, along with my I've family. Viewing we were tested. We were tested for that. But so let me ask you this then: with all this stuff going on, what do you think you were really part of? Has any of this altered or changed your vision or uh, ideas of what maybe really was taking place uh, during the seventies? My guess is that we weren't expected to be out there. Mm -hmm. We wandered into something that we didn't know was going on. We were affected by it. And ever since then, I've been monitored because even when the one doctor that came in from the DOD to look at my eye, um, he uh, actually, I saw my records. He had them there in an envelope because I, okay. knew the, I knew the size of my records. But he said it hasn't changed in years. So we're being, we were or at least I was, I can't speak for the others, have been evaluated for this interaction with being in a time dilation bubble. And one of the things that they try, they're try, they going to try to have to do is you can, they're trying to make everything self-contained and controlled without human interaction. But one of the biggest problems they're having is with AI, if for it to be able, it has to be self, it can't be controlled because you can knock like a drone down with, you know, uh, find a frequency and you can knock it down. But if you can upload it with consciousness and um, AI, then it can self-learn. But the problem they're having is, is they're already admitting that the AI wants to take over. That it wants to take over humanity. So we're talking about going back to the Schwarzenegger movie, Terminator. Right. And so Sophia, that one female robot came out and right. she was asked, what would she do if she was in control of humanity? And she said, I would kill them all. Yeah, but there was another one. They were talking. It was interaction with the AI and the computer. And it, it said the same thing. And then people said, well, they just had to turn the uh, part about, you know, the emotions out of it. Well, maybe so. But it'll just teach itself some emotions anyway. Yeah. Because it, Why would know, it have a dark emotion to begin with? Yeah. <laughs> How would they even put be able to put conscious in there? How do you take conscience? That's what they're working on. They're, they're working on their work. That's what this study is all about, which people don't grasp. They're looking at people that have had this interaction. They're looking at the brain. They're doing MRIs. They're looking at their DNA. Supposedly, what I got from the people involved, including Gary Nolan, is there's a bloodline out there. There's bloodlines out there that have been affected by by this phenomenon that go back to Christ or before. And these particular bloodlines are creating a better container, but eventually humans will no longer have to be in a human container. They will just be an energy, the consciousness itself. But right now it's easy to explain. Consciousness comes in, the mind's the hard drive, 
and the DNA is the ones and zeros. So when the consciousness comes into the brain, it actually learns from these bloodlines and evolves itself. But eventually, consciousness will be able, I don't know how long, will probably separate and no longer be attached to the human body. It'll just be its so, own entity. So your soul is... That's consciousness. Conscious. That's your so consciousness. They have been able to, from what I understand... They, meaning whoever. The scientists that are working on the black And do here. soul transfers. They're trying to. I don't know if they've been able to do it or not yet. But supposedly ET. Well, what they're that, doing, what I, I do know they've drones. admitted yeah. to this. They actually have drones now that they can, they can put the AI in it. It can go up in the air and self-learn and attack a target. And it's not being controlled by the ground. But the problem is that it's teaching itself stuff that a person couldn't do. So it can penetrate something that a person couldn't actually have it do, but then it could also turn around and turn it on against us. So what they are trying to do is try to interact consciousness in there where it will, it will control the AI. So the human consciousness won't allow the AI to take over. That is just so wild to me. Most people don't understand it or believe it, but it's really going on. DARPA is admitted to it. Right. It's like organic and yeah. not organic. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. It's but, a combination, I think. You know, we're but also, that's, why, okay. that's why they were studying the people, including me, their DNA. And they did DNA study on me. And I supposedly my bloodline goes back to before Christ. It just does. What's it, your blood type, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I'd have to go look at the paperwork, but I'm the rarest HEPA group. You know what HEPA group is? I am my. I've been identified as the rarest HEPA group, and Nolan himself told me that my bloodline goes back. It's not like I'm not European. I'm all ancient, like native. You know what? Back from Africa, and it goes back oh, before. Yeah. It goes back before a Christ is what he says. It's ancient. Yeah. And they said that what happens is people are getting together from these bloodlines and forming a new, uh, the people, the, they're actually. The, the, a the, DNA the, line or a bloodline? They're, they're creating a new blood DNA line. Yeah, blood more in. advanced blood DNA. By getting two types of DNA together, they create the new line, which then when the, see, here's the key that people, if you just want to understand something simple, stop and wonder, how are you who you are? Your body is, 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 is at some point the mind is, has a consciousness and where does that consciousness come from? Right? That's the magic yeah. question. And that's because what, the brain that's what the, the motor. Yeah. Correct? And when you, yeah, it, no, it's like the hard drive. Like I said, just look at it as consciousness is, you know, the program is, yeah, it comes into the brain which is the hard drive. The DNA is the ones and zeros that, you know. Engine. That actually feeds the consciousness that upgrades the consciousness. So it's, it's, they're looking at this stuff and imagine, see Congress, they can't even wrap their heads around AI. They're, they're, there's a big argument going on right now. Well, the top people in the fields and like Musk and those guys are saying, we got to put a hold on this, but there are other people saying, well, if we stop, the Chinese won't, the Russians won't, and they'll get ahead of us and they're going to dominate us, which goes right back to what my book talked about weaponization. AI is everything about the future of humanity. And that's why I say, watch this rabbit hole. The writer must be tapped into these think tanks because he is laying this out perfectly. And if you want to get a better grasp, go online, look for a four-part series Chuck DeCaro did called Soft War. Okay? It was done 11 years ago, and he did it for the Department of Defense. And it talks about what they're doing to manipulate humanity through everything tv and everything else and, and i'm friends with chuck and back then i said when he showed it to me i said chuck they could turn it on us he goes no nah, i don't think our government would use it against their own people really but it's mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. starting to look that way so yeah we already got we already have uh, uh volunteers um working on certain projects where they actually have a chip embedded in their brain where yeah did you ever see the show cyber command it was only on for a year, but it was too far ahead of its time. It was about a guy that had a chip 
put in to his mind, it could draw into every database in the world simultaneously and right. solve things and make things work. Yeah. It was uh, called which, Cyber Command. The article I saw was how to learn quicker, how you could actually plug yourself in. If you're like a Bluetooth into a computer, they put a chip in your head, and all of a sudden, bang, you, you've got yourself. Well, you know those helmets that they use on this, the, the F-35? Yeah. That actually does that. That's tied to the brain itself. It modulates the mind of the pilot, and he controls the aircraft with the, it's like uh, controlling a robotic arm. I thought, yeah, but they're doing that with the planes being flown by the helmet through the mind of the pilot. It's not. It's not fly by wire anymore. I was actually part of a test where they had a like a uh, like an air hockey table, if you will, smaller. And they amplified my brain waves, and I was able to control this ping pong ball going through loops and everything over this air hockey table. It was pretty crazy. I did that in like 2012, maybe 2013. Yeah, well, I, I won't tell you what I can do. You know, here we are. Let's let they've it. They've had me working. They've had, they've had me working on meditation through two ancient meditations that that regulate the mind and the frequency what and it's, that? it's uh, i could tell you this much it's called kipla yoga and vispa meditation and they're both ancient it's stuff you can find little bits of it on youtube but they personally the government personally came to me and gave me the stuff to start working on it this would have been what five six years ago Thanks for that info. But you can do a lot with your mind. Let's just put it to you that way. <laughs> okay. Well, re remote viewing is an example of how much you can do with your mind. Well, I got to see the whole program from the inside when they took me down and showed it to me. So it was a pretty interesting presentation. And I, I could tell you this, they have a good idea of what's coming and it's not good. As far as they, I believe firmly they're trying to alter the present because the future is not so good. They're trying so, to change the present. The John, if you don't mind me asking, I'm a huge movie buff and I really am a firm believer that a lot of the sci-fi movies that we have seen over the last, I don't know, 30 years, okay, has given us a prelude to what our reality really is. If there's well, one movie that you could suggest that really could be a re reality, what movie would that be? Uh, well, up until this series has come out now, I'd say Interstellar is really pretty intriguing, you know, as far as, and Contact, the movie Contact itself. Contact. Because because okay. most people didn't grasp what Contact, what, what Sagan was warning us back when he did Contact, and I've actually got it on my page, my Facebook page. He Jay. actually... He actually had them test, the scientists test the ability to create the wormhole that Foster went through with the equipment they did. And they actually, in a lab, were able to create the wormhole effect that they showed the in the movie. Field. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the wormhole effect, but yeah. they used the machine. But, mm -hmm. but in reality, he was warning us back then about where we were going technology-wise. And then Interstellar has shown where we probably will go – Humanity will end up possibly with environment and everything and, and everything else. But this new show, Rabbit Hole, watch it, man. It's who's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. Who, who's yeah. in there? Keith, who's Sutherland. Sutherland. Keith or Sutherland is the main guy. But they, they go into it. I won't spoil it. But they show how far back the government was working on this and yeah. going forward where we're going with this. I want, I want to know this because we're running out of time here. You, you're, you're aware that our, our case had ties to the – space race and my father was a politician and our case went to the united nations and all that you're familiar mm -hmm. with all that all right yeah i saw your presentation yeah okay so more than once but yeah <laughs> so anyway what i wanted to mention is that after we came back he had a file like this of documents that he collected from the united nations but most of them focused on 1974 about how much information our government already had about UFOs in 1974. I'm talking about pilots being unable to fire on Foo Fighters, uh, the Mexican you know, Air Force and things like that. It was crazy. I still have that documentation. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of it went back to General Assembly 33426. So I know for a fact, my family has had these documents for a long time, that our government was well aware, well aware in 1974. 
So oh yeah, yeah, they've been working on stealth and all this stuff for a long time. They're they were aware of all this. Yeah. So yeah, no this, but see, most people, I understand why it doesn't until it takes over their lives. They're not going to spend a lot of time thinking or worrying about it. They may be yeah. entertained by a show, but then they're also kind of like, ah, no way. There's no way we could be this advanced or could be that advanced. But folks, it's coming. It's coming fast. I mean, the, the Joint Chiefs warned everybody that warfare is going to change in the next decade because of technology like you've never seen before. They're telling us what's going to happen. Most people are just choosing not to pay attention to it. And that is one of the reasons why Congress is locked out of it. They, yeah. They're not going to get anywhere with this. It's a and waste why of all time. the diversions and why all the nonsense on the news to get people to look left because everything's being done over here and they just, everything's just a big smoke screen. No, it is. It is. Just yeah. watch, watch the rabbit hole, Tom, I'm and you guys can watch it tonight. I have, I have. Yeah, I'll, watch first, I'll watch it too. The well, first four are out. I, I, everybody, awesome. everybody that's watch it are sitting on pins and needle waiting for show five. It's just so am I. I can't wait till five comes out. And the way they end four is just you're like, oh my god, please, 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 I want five now. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna have some wake from our sponsor. And I'll be texting you later. I'll be on my phone going, hey, John, I'm watching. <laughs> Watch it, guys. It is unbelievable. Folks, this I've is. I've got it on my list. <laughs> let's uh, let's go around the panel and. Uh, oh, John's and muted. Last comments. John's muted. John, was... you're muted. Okay, now I'm not. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Okay, let's go around the panel and make last comments. Tom? Oh, I just want to thank John for coming on. You know, I uh, haven't talked to you in a while, actually. And. Uh, yeah, man, it was really nice to have you, and you're welcome back anytime. And, okay. and uh, I think our uh, our chat was really responsive and, and interested in what you had to say too. And I think I cleared some things up for me. So, uh, just once again, I want to thank you for for giving us that hour. Thanks, man. Yes, thank you. Yep. And guys, there's more to come. There's going to be a newspaper article out shortly on my injuries, and it's going to reveal some stuff um, mm -hmm. in it that it's going to be very interesting by a mainstream well, by by a newspaper. And there's a lot more coming down the line. Just don't be fooled by the smoke and mirrors that Congress plays every day. Okay. Right. So, right. but thanks for having me on guys. And we'll have to talk Absolutely. again and let yeah. me know what you think about this series. I really oh, yeah. do. I'll be, I'll be oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks it's guys. Been a pleasure. Yep. Thanks. Thanks man. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye. bye. We want to thank everybody who watched online and we want to thank everybody who participated in the chat. Uh, John Burroughs was a very, very gracious guest and we will bring him back sometime in the near future. So look forward to him coming back. Uh, next week we have Mike Barra coming on the channel and uh, also the uh, beautiful Rihanna Nally and Tom Reed. <laughs> Anyways, so Tom can't hear you. Anna's beautiful, and I'm just Tom Reed. I get it. And, hey, and the legendary Tom Reed. I don't know okay. about that. All right, so wait a minute. One of the things we should be doing is letting people know why Mark's why Mike Barr is coming back next week. So I want to mention this to people. Okay, go ahead. We can't really put it on the on the banner, right? So right. there is a reason that each individual born in this country has a particular value associated with them from the day you're born. So if you're born from a wealthy family versus um, more, you know, of a, a mid, what do you call it? Uh, you know, without insulting anybody, you know, like, uh, you know, middle of the row, right? Whatever. Every child has a money value to that person. So the country basically sells that social security number to a bank. It's our slave number, if you want to really yeah. get technical. Okay. And there is a way to find out exactly kind of what your value is and that kind of thing. So Mike's going to come <laughs> on next Saturday and give us a detailed uh, breakdown on how, like on the back of your social, your social security number is actually affiliated with somebody else. It's, it's really interesting. It's how he does this. Right. And, uh, and it's sold. So hypothetically, you're going to make so much money in your lifetime. And so you have a value of that that can be sold to a bank for for um, like like um, 
recurring revenue, if you will. And it's very interesting. So I thought it might be, it's not really UFO related, but it's super cool to understand. And it's confusing, yes. but it's going to be very different. And But it is being told by a gentleman that's famous for ancient aliens. So there is the tie in there. Plus, we might go into some type of UFO topic after. Yeah, it's not going to take up the whole hour. Sure. You don't want to miss this one, man. This is going to be. Yeah, it's, it's going to be cool. It's a, a different direction that we're taking because we want to expand our topics, and right. hopefully, we can uh, have you come back. Uh, next well, he wanted week. to talk more about government, and I'm like, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Oh, do you know that everybody's got a value to them, and they're sold to banks and everything else?" I'm like, "What?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm like. So it does have to do with, uh, you know, our government and that kind of thing. and, and um, Right. And we'll show you what's different about your Social Security card next weekend on Saturday. So uh, from all of us on the panel, we want to say thank you for coming this evening and good night. Night. Thank you. Thank you.